This evening, uh, we have Dr. Jerry Bergman, who is a, a creation scientist. He's going to speak on a topic that is very near and dear to his heart called uh, uh, Evolution's Blunders, Frauds, and Forgeries. Just a few words on uh, Jerry Bergman. Um, he is uh, remarkably well educated with nine advanced degrees, and he's taught at universities, uh, uh, I I think 30, 35 years now, and various uh, topics related to biology, biochemistry, and genetics. And uh, he has um, more than 1,400 publications in science journals, both in secular journals as well as in uh, creation journals. And uh, he, he's written, uh, been author of about 43 different books now, and they are generally available through Amazon and some other creation ministries as well. And uh, it, when I post this message, I will give you a pointer to all those books that he has. So what is he going to speak on tonight? We call the topic Darwin's Blunders, Frauds, and Forgeries. If you look at the history of the theory of evolution, starting from Darwin and all the people that supported it, and uh, even in modern days, you'll find that the history is full of blunders, things that were said to be true in the Darwinian theory, but they turned out not to be true. And then there's some outright frauds as well, and which is, uh, uh, it, it just spots the whole history of the theory of evolution, and then some outright forgeries. So Jerry's going to cover these things in his um, talk this evening, and then at the after the talk, we'll go through a few uh, uh, questions. So Jerry, welcome, and uh, we look forward to hearing you talk on this matter. Thank you. It's good to be here. I can't change this. Okay, there we go. Okay, I reviewed a number of cases. I did a book on this, and I have enough material to do another book. So there's a lot of evidence on this area. I can mention these cases are not controversial. I haven't any controversy about them because basically it's well documented in history. So there really is no concern that indeed I'm not creating the, not covering the whole field properly. And so uh, this is my book which has got, I think, about 30 diff 35 different cases. Some of the most well-known cases are in this book. And again, I have enough material for another book, which I hope to publish soon. And I'm not the only one that looks at this. Randy Gazzola has also, Gazzola, sorry, has also mentioned this in a number of his books. But one good example here you can see on the screen here is where we, uh, the review is from the fish to modern man. And you can see the evolution from fish to modern man, and this is supposed to be the face. And <laughs> you're looking at the face changes. And uh, the problem is all of these are created by an artist, and there really is no direct evidence for most of these. And the best example here, of course, you can see from the, uh, the Greek, actually that's a Greek statue, and then three pictures over is a monkey. And <laughs> many... Uh, picture, <laughs> you show my little cough here. Many pictures show the same thing, only they show more gradations between the monkey and the man. And in most cases, the less evolved man is a black man or a man from Australia, <laughs> Australian Aborigine. The basic problem is evolution is based on mutations. And the simple fact is we know that 99.9% percent of all mutations are either near neutral or harmful. That means the vast majority do not help the case but hurt the case. And of course we've studied mutations for 110 years now and so we know a great deal about the whole situation of mutations. And uh, there's many types. There's deletion, duplication, and inversion. And we've studied these very carefully and we know what most mutations are. They're damaged to the genome they do not improve the genome. And one well-known example was a finding in the ocean bottom, 
and they thought this was the first form of life. And you can see the drawings here, one on the left and then on the right. And these basically show that indeed they thought that this was the beginning of life. This was in between non-life and life. Well, it turns out these were nothing more than precipitations and they had nothing to do with life. They were not alive, they were never alive. And indeed, the evidence is very clear that they had nothing to do with life. These were done by Ernst Haeckel. Ernst Haeckel was a very talented artist. And to show that, I showed some pictures here. And so when he drew many drawings, which he did, many of them were forgeries. And so it was not a lack of artistic talent that caused him to produce the distortions he did. But indeed, he was pretty open later on in life that he was basically trying to mislead for good reasons. It's like a, uh, a lie that you tell to help somebody else. And he felt these lies were helpful because they would help people believe in evolution. And that was his goal. But of course, now it's an embarrassment to scientists what he did. But by the way, there are hundreds of these drawings and he was an incredibly talented artist. And I just picked a few of the many that are available. So it's not a lack of artistic talent that caused him to do what he did. These are pictures of Ernst Haeckel. Uh, the one on my left would be when he was a young man. And then the other one was when he was quite a bit older. He, by the way, was very influential in biology in Germany. He was a German, taught at German University for most of his career. And he also influenced a number of scientists, which influenced Adolf Hitler. And so we know where Hitler got a lot of his ideas from. And many of them go back to our good friend, Ernst Haeckel. And here, Louis Pasteur finally totally disproved the idea of spontaneous generation. And you can see that he used fruit flies or flies that laid eggs on meat when they could do so, no problem, in the picture on the left. And then when you put a barrier preventing them from reaching the meat, there were no flies on the meat and thus there were no eggs, no maggots on the meat. And there's a good picture of our a friend Louis Pasteur. By the way, his main motivation was creationism. He was a creationist and he wanted to prove the spontaneous generation of life. And the Batipus Hekeli is the picture I showed a few minutes ago. And he believed this was the source of all life. So it was not a small mistake, it was a major mistake. And this link between inorganic and organic life eventually, of course, was proved to be false. And uh, a suspension was, it was basically as a result of putting material in solution. And then, of course, it came out of solution when the traits changed. One of the more famous, well-known is Hesperopithecus. This is a drawing done by a very famous French artist, who, by the way, did quite a few drawings along this line. And he was showing what indeed has Peropithecus looked like. And now we know his Peropithecus was based on a single tooth. And this tooth happened to be from a pig, which I'll show you in a minute. And you can see what a nice drawing he produced. Not only Mr. His Peropithecus, but his wife and animals you can see in the background. And these were the teeth they found. They were not in good shape, but nonetheless, they interpret them as coming from a human. And this is an article in Science Magazine, the most prestigious magazine in the world at the time. And you can see that they, he highlighted this Hesperopithecus as being a valid finding. And here is one from a paleontology journal. And again, the uh, Hesperopithecus was highlighted. And this is another drawing from Ernst Haeckel. And you can see now he is taking even more artistic license. And we start out with an amoeba at bottom of the picture, the top left of the picture, and we end up with a, a primitive man, in this case, an Australian. And you can see many of these pictures are very contrived. And interestingly, in the line here, he has a kangaroo. So he puts in our evolutionary line, a kangaroo. And they found out later on, because they found more teeth, that these teeth were from a precary, which is a new, new world pig. And there you can see the precary. Now this may seem totally foolish, but actually it's not because pig's teeth and human teeth are very much alike. We find this in doing organ transplants. We find some unlikely organisms have organs more suited to transplant than animals that are more similar to humans, at least 
ostensibly uh, from the outside. And so it's not always easy to tell where, where teeth came from. And in this case, it's a good example. You've got to be really careful. And there you can see our friend. I understand this is a wild pig and they're pretty mean. Reading Negroes and Apes, I try to avoid the use of the word Negro, but I will use it because it was used in the day that this attempt occurred. This was a person who tried to breed a human and a chimp by artificial insemination. And he basically was trying to do this to show how close apes and humans were. And he tried and tried and failed consistently. But it's interesting that he wanted to do this in a German colony. And he tried to get permission. He was a Russian. Uh, Ivanovich was a Russian. And he tried to get permission from the German government to do this breeding experiment in Africa. And the German government said, no way. We are trying to work very closely with the African population. And we do not want you to interfere with our good relationships with the Africans. <laughs> we can see how much Germany changed in a few years in contrast to this experience. And there is Ivanovich. He was, by the way, a very well-known breeder. He bred for many years a number of very important horses in the field of, uh, of race horses and so on, as well as other animals. And so he was an ideal person to do this, but again, he was never successful. I don't think he would ever be successful because there are too many differences between uh, human eggs and uh, monkey eggs. And ironically, Professor Barish, who is now a professor at the University of California, he said, and I quote, by no mean, it is by no means unlikely that a hybrid combining a, combining a human being and a chimpanzee could be produced in a laboratory. After all, he said, humans and chimp or bonobo share by most estimates roughly 99% of their nuclear DNA. And this is not a quote that was 30 years old or 40 years old, it was from a 1918 journal, only a couple years old. And the interesting thing is, is that we know back about 10 years ago, we knew that the similarity is not 99%, and now we know it's about 85%, which means it's over a half a billion DNA base differences. And so the difference between human and chimp DNA is enormous. And this is very clear in the literature. And he, doesn't, he didn't seem to want to look or didn't look very carefully in the literature. He was just repeating an idea that has been repeated often since because, well, 99% figure sounds good, but it's just not true. Now, of course, the difference between apes and humans is such where it's clear from the DNA alone that they're not related. Is this the future? This is Stalin. Of course, they were excited about uh, this Amanzi project and the goal was to be able to produce a hybrid which they could put in service from the country, for example, in the military. And this is a picture of that attempt, but of course it never worked. These are other pictures which are not only distorted, but they are also show the attempt to buy pictures. As they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. And the goal is basically to show how closely related uh, blacks were, this is the German uh, illustration, and orangutans were. At that time, they used to think we were closer to orangutans than chimps. Now, of course, the opinion has changed to chimps. And you don't need to say anything about this picture. There it is. And there are many, many other pictures. In fact, the major proof for evolution for about a hundred years was inferior races. And I'm collecting pictures now which show that this was widely illustrated in many books. And what they showed was a progression from the inferior rates, inferior races, mostly, of course, uh, African Americans and the uh, and monkeys. And the drawings were such where it looked there was a very fine gradation between uh, chimps in most cases and the inferior human races. And uh, there are many illustrations that do a good job showing this. And of course, this is very, very misleading. The pictures, as you may imagine, are quite distorted. And some of the pictures I show are indeed very distorted. And this is a good example. I've never seen a Hootentot that looked like that. And I've never seen a female gorilla that looked like that. They were gross distortions. And many of these are distortions. But of course, back then, people didn't question it. They looked at these pictures and they said, well, 
I guess that's a gorilla and that's a female Hootentai. Many in Western Europe had never seen a gorilla or a Hootentai. Now with zoos today, we have the ability to see these differences, but uh, back then, how many people went to zoos? And how many people could see a gorilla or at least up close? Pithecanthropus alis is another example, and again, Heckel. Heckel figures in a lot of these forgeries, and he basically believed that man evolved from the apes, and he said, therefore, we should find a creature in between, physically in between the two. And this idea inspired many paleontologists, and they went to a number of countries looking for this Pithecanthropus alis, never found quite what they were looking for, but indeed, this writing by Heckel inspired quite a few major finds. And a couple of examples are, of course, Java Man, as well as uh, Peking Man, both which are now recognized to be simply uh, uh, humans. And when this idea came forth, we had, guess what? Pictures showing the two individuals. And of course, we had no fossil evidence. We had nothing. We had just had an idea. But these pictures were widely displayed in many different textbooks. And uh, I have quite a few examples of these which I've come across. Here's another one which shows you how different they are. This is the same guy, Pithecanthropus alice, but indeed it's written, done by a different artist. So we can see artistic uh, license is very prominent in many of these pictures. By the way, this Pithecanthropus alice is supposed to have lived in a mythical land called Lemuria. And uh, there are many stories about this place, which of course now is totally debunked. And there you can see the two pictures together so you can see how different they looked. And you see an expression on their face and the ape-like faces and the woman, his wife, I guess, and the baby they have. So we've got a family here. And uh, not a very handsome family, but I guess back then they were felt to be these were the what the missing links would look like. The facial angle theory was widely publicized for many years. And what they did was they measured the angle between the jaws and the forehead. And this angle was determined to evaluate how inferior or superior racially you were. And this was used not only to show the difference between apes and humans, but also different races. And this is a good example. You can see here that one, two, three, four, four of these are different races. And you can see they're compared to the Caucasian race, they're all inferior. And again, as I stress, the major evidence for evolution, human evolution, human evolution was for 100 years, the existence of primitive races. And so this was a major feature in many textbooks, which I'm now working on illustrating that. And here's another example. There are hundreds of examples. And again, you can see the superior races going all the way down. And of course, now we have, we're going back in this case to, uh, to a fish. And another example. And another is the evolutionary progression, which we see everywhere. It's one of the most common illustrations of Darwinism everywhere. And we can see the ape starting here on the left, and we end up on the right, the uh, human, the fully evolved human. And then we have the inferior races in between, and we go all the way back to the chimp, I guess that's supposed to be. But this is a myth. There are no, none of these examples exist except, well, the, the last example here and the first example ex exists, but that's it. So all the ones, everyone in between, are simply false. They're simply an artist's imagination. And then when this was first displayed in a Time magazine book, they mentioned that most of these were theoretical or based on very poor evidence. But people didn't look at the fine print. They looked at the picture, and these pictures, therefore, were so widely I distributed. So this really isn't a forgery because they told you when they did the illustration that this is not uh, true, that there are problems, that it's based on poor evidence. But nonetheless, people ignored that, and this, of course, has been widely uh, publicized. This is another famous example, again, Heckel. He comes up over and over, and Heckel's drawings we now see are forgeries as well. And again, it wasn't because of his lack of talent, because he had plenty of talent. He could have drawn some incredibly good pictures, but they were accepted for what, a hundred years? And only they were disproven recently. And also what was accepted was the idea is humans have a tail, 
and have Gauss loops. Well, neither of those exist, and in the books that I used when I was teaching, several of the biology books claimed that humans had gill slits and they had tails. Well, humans as embryos have neither one. And an excellent book, beautiful book, I think if I would have written it, I wouldn't have changed a word, by Nick Hopwood, and it was about, I don't know, 400 pages, and he basically shows that these were forgeries why and how, and he investigated not only Heckel's writings, but he also investigated Heckel's works, his letters. He was a German scientist, or at least worked in Germany to do this research, and he showed indeed they were deliberate forgeries. And what we see here is they're very similar at certain stages, far more similar at other stages, and far different at other stages. And so this is called the hourglass uh, picture because it shows that they become more similar, very similar, and this is the stage that Heckel used. But even this stage where they're very similar, they're still very different. And there you can see what they look like today. And this is Heckel's drawings, and this is actual drawings from photographs taken of the embryos, and you can see the difference. It's enormous. And these are photographs, the photographs they used. Here are Heckel's drawings, and here are the real embryos. So again, there's huge differences, but yet these are still occasionally found in textbooks. Although what they say is that, well, the drawings were distorted, but the idea is correct. So he was trying to show something that's true, but he, yeah, didn't do a good job honestly conveying this, but it's still true, and of course it's not true. And then again, we see, uh, Richardson's photographs, which were done in 1997. So we see again the same thing. Galton was Darwin's cousin. Galton became a Darwinist by reading uh, his, his cousin's work, Charles Darwin, and he was convinced of evolution. And the next step was, well, if evolution is true, then there must be inferior races. And Galton spent his life trying to identify inferior races. And Galton's racial theories influenced enormously Charles Darwin himself. Darwin said, I think Galton's right. There are clearly inferior races. And uh, this inferior race idea reflected itself in, of course, Charles Darwin's works. Another example which surprised me and that Galton came up with a fingerprint idea and you can see the arch, the loop and the world, but he came up with this idea, uh, Galton did, in trying to prove race because he thought, well, sometimes it's hard to prove race by facial traits. So maybe fingerprints will do it. And he spent years getting fingerprints from those he thought were an inferior race and those he thought were part of a superior race. And he ended up concluding that, well, this doesn't do it. In fact, this is not helpful at all. So he admitted he was wrong, but nonetheless, the idea of fingerprints caught on. So that's, I guess, one good thing in the end. He, he did manage to convince the people of the usefulness of fingerprints. Ancon Sheep was another example. This was repeated by Charles Darwin in several places. And basically the sheep in the middle here, you can see his short legs. And this, Darwin said, was a new species. So when people said, well, what evidence do we have for evolution? Darwin said, right here, we have in one generation a new species. That's a different species of sheep. Uh, sheep. Therefore, how can you deny evolution? There's the evidence. And he repeated this several times. Well, it wasn't long after this fact in the 30s that this was proven to be not a new species, but a deformed sheep. In fact, what happened was most of the Ancon sheep died. They were so deformed that they could not live very long and they could not reproduce. And so this idea, even though this was spread in the textbooks I use in teaching, some of them copyright in the uh, 90s, they use this example as proof of evolution. So it takes a long time, sometimes a hundred years, before the textbooks catch up with the reality. And uh, Darwin first discussed this idea in 1859. And by the way, you might say, what's the advantage? Well, the advantage is you don't have to build large, tall fences to keep the sheep in. Sheep are very independent. They wander off on their own. So therefore you have to have a sheep herder to make sure all the sheep stay in the herd. And many animals are herding animals, so you don't have to worry about that. They stay with the herd, but sheep don't do that. So they had to have a fence 
a tall fence, and of course, with the Encon sheep, you only need a short fence, so you could save a lot of money. And uh, in fact, the first person known to use the Encon sheep as evidence for evolution was Darwin himself. And I came up with four times he used it, but could be more. Another example Darwin talked about was the peacock feathers. This, the theory is that the fancy tails, the feathers, would attract mates. And this was in Darwin's book. He came up with this idea. And this idea has been repeated ever since. Finally, somebody else came along and said, somebody from Japan, by the way, so I wonder if that's really true. So he took the peacocks and peahens and tried to see whether or not the peahens really preferred peacocks with more beautiful tails. And he found, they found no evidence. They just did, they didn't look at the tails. Tails are irrelevant. It may have attracted the peahens to the peacocks, but the beauty of the tail was, was irrelevant. They, there was no evidence between anything in the tails besides, I guess, having tails helps because they're more visible. But, and this by uh, Takashi et al. refuted the sexual selection idea. But this is still repeated in the textbooks and it just isn't true from what research that he did. And there's a magnification of the tails and they are quite beautiful. We think they are, but everybody, the peahen doesn't think at all they are. In fact, the tails are a problem there. You can see the peacock uh, with a tail, which is quite a drag in escaping predators, not very successful. So indeed, uh, it's a harm, it's a problem to the peacock. Uh, and here you can see pictures of the history of mankind. And these are prehistoric men. This is in the Museum of Natural History in New York City and uh, the American Museum of Natural History. And you can see the modern man is on the right and you can see then the inferior men are placed next to him. And actually these were all simply different racial groups. The Java man, Cro-Magnon man, these are just different racial groups which are still around today. Now if you gave them a haircut and combed their hair and, and uh, fixed them up a little bit, you would see that they would look very much like modern man. But uh, indeed, this is what they showed. Piltown man, the most famous frog ever. And Piltown man basically was a skull of a human and the jaw of a part of the jaw, the lower part of the jaw, of a uh, orangutan. And uh, you can see in uh, white the actual areas they found, and in black you can see the distortions. And then when they drew from that, they drew this man here. This is a drawing of Pelton Man, done by our French artist again. And uh, later on then, it didn't take long to realize that it was not only forgery, but it was a poorly done forgery. And indeed, all of these casts they made were, were fake. And there you can see a picture of him. This isn't quite as bad, but this is one of the reconstructions. But it was used in textbooks for decades. It was discovered to be in the early 50s, 53, to be a forgery. And once they looked at it somewhat carefully, they found the teeth were filed down, and so they fit because, of course, the teeth in the uh, orangutan's jaw doesn't fit those in humans, so they had to do some modifications. And uh, finally, they did the uh, studies and they found indeed it was a forgery. And uh, you can see that there's quite a bit of hullabaloo, hullabaloo about what happened and there are many people who were blamed for it and probably the guy that discovered it, Dawson probably was the one that, that supposedly discovered it. He was the one that did the forgery. He did other forgeries as well, so we shouldn't be surprised. But he died not long after this was uh, presented to the world. And there we can see, uh, these are, you can see the uh, different parts that they use to fabricate, uh, not only Piltdown Man, but others as well. And one thing that caused me to question this right away was, this was discovered in a damp area in London. There's no way this is gonna preserve, this area is gonna preserve fossils for even 50 years, let alone a couple of hundred thousand years or 50,000, the date changed by the way, but there's no way this could preserve fossils for that length of time, it just can't. In teaching forensics, this is one thing we're very concerned about because 
when you find in some of these skeletons, we knew when the person died. One, for example, they died in 1947. But yet when the remains were discovered, there was hardly any evidence in the skull that we found of the person that had died. The skull was pretty much deteriorated. There wasn't much left at all. And therefore, bones are not going to last very long in this kind of an environment. And uh, you, you have to wonder about these people. When they found out it was discovered in this area, and they went to the area many times, of course, looking for evidence. And uh, when it was <laughs> discovered there, you, you'd think they would say, wait a minute, this is, this is a damp area. Every year we have a rainstorm or more. And this is in Britain where, of course, they had many uh, torrential rainstorms. And so therefore, they should have realized that this is, this is a forgery. It just couldn't be real. Delvin Man, another case. And this, the, the skull was from a, a human. And uh, the other bones were from, evidently from uh, other creatures, a modern human. So uh, although this skull, there's somewhat debate about what it was, but uh, some classify, because there wasn't much there. You can see they just had the skull top and a couple of teeth. And therefore, this was uh, now some classified as a Pithecanthropus erectus. And there you can see the pictures. And this is now from a textbook here. And they're comparing this with a picture in the museum. And we can see here uh, not only Piltdown man, but also Neanderthal man, which are now, of course, regarded as our uh, relatives. There's simply another people group. I don't like the word race. I prefer people group because that's more accurate. That's less uh, derisive than the term race, but a people group. So I, this is another people group. That's what they were. And we can see that this is in high school biology book. And you can see they look at these pictures and they say, well, there's proof of evolution. In fact, this was very important in my conversion to evolution. In my paleoanthropology book in college, I looked at these pictures and I thought, and they've got the skulls, evolution must be true. They've got the proof, how can you deny it? You can't deny the evidence, there it is. And of course, these are some of the Piltdown fossils, so which are not in very good shape anyways. And then here's another case. This was a Confuci Confucius Sornius, Sornius. And uh, this was a, again, a found to be a uh, fraud. And again, this was one that it didn't take long at all to discover it was a fraud. It was very poorly done. And uh, this fossil was unearthed in China. It appeared to be a perfect museum quality fossil of a bird dinosaur transition. In fact, there was a nice article in the National Geographic about it. And when this article was published, there was already good evidence that it was a forgery. But they thought, well, it seems good. And so they published it. Anyways, and uh, there we go. There's another picture, and there's a National Geographic cover story it got. And dinosaur takes wing. Beautiful set of pictures, but of course, now we know it's a forgery. And National Geographic did print an apology uh, in the back of the magazine about a short paragraph two months later, which hardly any people saw. And so this was touted as genuine evidence of bird, uh, dinosaur bird evolution, although it did get a lot of publicity. And so it, the publicity, of course, helped people realize that, hey, you're being fooled. And this is the picture from the National Geographic. And there you can see the T-Rex, and of course, then the next page, they have the, the uh, picture. And moving on, and when we did analysis of it, they found that exactly where the parts came from, how it was put together. And uh, again, a number of historians looked at this and said, hey, there's a problem. It took five, 10 minutes for some of these to realize there's a problem, but there's no proof. So they did some scans. Uh, Chris Rowe, by the way, did some CT scans, and then he showed it was glued together and it was just unequivocally a fossil. Now you think National Geographic, before they publicized the information about this, you think they would have had the scans done or at least some evaluation. I mean, scans are pretty simple. You just put in the scanner, push a button, and there you go. But they didn't do any evaluation at all. And people who look at this case explain that the reason they didn't was because it was just good. It was good evidence. And they just didn't want to believe it wasn't true. 
The problem of fraud in science is a major problem. It's a serious, deeply rooted problem. And especially ironically in medicine, it turns out to be a problem. Now, when I say a problem, I don't mean 40% of all scientific studies are fraudulent, uh, but there are millions of scientific studies and it may only be one out of a thousand, they're fraudulent, but that still turns out to be a lot of studies. It still is a problem. And uh, why do scientists perpetuate these frauds? Well, one is self-delusion. They found some scientists have perpetuated dozens of frauds. Another is, Getting tenure in a university, you gotta come up with evidence. You gotta come up with some discoveries. And so therefore you have a family, you just moved into an area, you've been at the university for six years, and you need to have some, something that will be important that will allow you to be awarded tenure. And so people come up with these frauds deliberately and sometimes they see what they expect to see, not what's there. And so it's hard to say, and of course, uh, some of these are not discovered, and so we have people who perpetuate a fraud. They, they get tenure, they have security, and they're never found out. But some, of course, eventually are found out. And uh, how do we deal with this? How do you and I deal with this? Well, I can't stress this enough. Read, read, read. Evolution is widely believed by so many people today, but the vast majority of people have never read a single book about evolution. And I, most of the books I read are about evolution, but I read it critically and I analyze the evidence and I look at it carefully and I realize that there's a problem here. I may not always discover right away there's a problem, but I keep it in mind and I keep reading other books and I find invariably the claims for evolution, invariably I find they're simply not true, they're wrong. And of course I've been doing this for what, 50 some years and I read on the average about a book a week. So I've read many hundreds of books and so you know I'm pretty well read and this is a major interest of mine and it's hard for the average person to do this but even if you read one book a month or one book a year and a lot of people say my books are very technical well some are but I write for lay audiences for in many cases and I say well just read and I do this myself I can't sit down and read a chapter or two at once I read two or three pages and put the book down I want to be fresh. Later on, I pick the book up again and read two or three pages. So read two or three, five or six pages, and I have books all around the house, by the way. My wife will uh, support that. I have in the living room, in the bathroom, in the bedrooms, and I read a few pages every day, and it's not long, and I get the book read. And so I recommend that. If you just get into a habit of reading, you'll find it's very rewarding, and just read a few pages, and eventually you realize that, indeed, evolution is wrong. It's not true. And read both sides. I read pot, major books written against creation. I read most of them. I just got one now. I've started reading. So, uh, but it's easy now for me to read these and realize they're wrong, wrong, wrong. But uh, 30 years ago, I couldn't do that. 30 years ago, I was somewhat convinced. I read a book against creation. I felt, well, I got a good case. Maybe evolution's wrong. But I kept reading and I realized that indeed the case is not good, it's very poor. In fact, the case for evolution, my conclusion now is it's pathetic. It's pathetic. Uh, fraud and science, I already mentioned that. And uh, how Darwinists maintain the upper hand, they do that by the respectable bully approach. They take an aggressive stand against creationists. They ridicule us, they mark us down in grades, then I tenure, and I have four volumes I've written which cover this. I call them the slaughter series. One is slaughter of the dissonance, the other is silencing the dissonance, and the other one is uh, censorship of the dissonance. And I document in about a thousand pages, I guess, indeed that these are all big problems. But on the other hand, if they have the evidence presented, if they don't have the evidence, well, they mark our grades down, they deny us tenure, they sack them, sack us if we get a staff position. So if they're right, just prove it. But often they, they don't or they don't want to. And so therefore the easiest way is just name calling. And so that's what they use. They use name calling. So you see that in a lot of uh, books written against creations. I come across that constantly. So that's my presentation.
Okay, thank you, Jerry. And perhaps you can put that last slide up again. Okay. And uh, do, do you have your contact information on that? No, I don't. Uh, okay. Maybe you could add that. Uh, if yeah. they contacted you, then you can put them in contact with me. But yeah, yeah, because I, I yeah, I, I will send out a message on uh, you know this lecture. Let people know that it's now uh, online. And I will also include a list of your books that you gave to me, and um, also how to get in contact with you. Um, but they're all on Amazon. If you want to save some money, go to addall.com, addall.com, and they have two or three hundred of my books, and you can get them for okay. a couple dollars to. Sometimes they cost more than Amazon, but uh, yeah. people want to get a good bargain, so that's another source. Yeah. Okay. So just a few questions, um, Jerry, just to, to fill out this uh, message. You know, of course, I've been studying this for quite a few years, too, and so I'm quite familiar with the problems that you've run into. And uh, perhaps you, you can give the audience just, just a few minutes uh, uh, of your testimony of, of why you came to believe in creation versus evolution, because I do believe in your early years of teaching at the university you did believe that evolution was true. Right. Just again, reading. I would I read critically. And when I read things, I say, now, wait a minute. Does this sound right? Does this sound true? And I had friends that presented. I befriended some creationists, and they presented some evidence. And I didn't accept what they had to say, but I did accept that they had some good points every now and then. And so probably had an interest in this for many years. Also, of course, I taught the science area for most of my career. And teaching the science area, of course, you come up with this a lot. And so once I realized certain ideas were not true, for example, uh, once I realized that the Heckel's embryos were not true, and then this bothered me when I saw it over and over in textbooks. And so they became less credible. Many of us, including myself, I believe that indeed, you know, the scientists, they're, they're right. Um, textbooks are right. I mean, how could... The textbooks be wrong. It's in the textbook. It must be true. But after a while, I realized that they're not always right because they're in the textbooks or the scientists say it. In fact, a lot of what scientists say are not true. And we can see that now with the coronavirus, that some of the predictions the scientists make turned out to be, I guess, fortunately, false. Yeah. And that's. Yeah. And I guess that in, in your history, of course, you taught in universities, mostly secular universities, I believe. But all secular, pretty much all secular. Yeah. And, and so you, you had to uh, you know, go through this transition while you were teaching at secular universities. Uh, did that present any kind of a problem to you? Oh, yeah. Bowling Green State University, I was there for seven years. And when it was Pretty obvious that I didn't go along with the Darwinian world. I published a monograph by Fidel F. Kaplan, which is the Honor Society in Education. And I basically questioned the validity of evolution and said, you know, maybe the other side has some good points. And my colleagues went to the roof on this. In fact, they cited this over and over. This is why they let me go. It was because this monograph that I published through Fidel F. Kaplan. And I lost my career there. Seven years, I lost my career. Yeah. And uh, they're pretty open about their antagonism toward my questioning evolution. You don't question evolution, you accept it. Yeah, and uh, your books on, uh, you have a series on uh, the dissidents. And uh, you know, I've got one here called The Slaughter of the Dissidents, which is volume number one. And uh, I guess in, in one of these volumes, you're going to include your story. Well, in some, I have an, a couple of other books. Called, one is called Persuaded by the Evidence, and the other is Transformed by the Evidence. And both of these, I include my own story. Yeah. And okay. these are people, again, who, be, who were evolutionists, became creationists, or remained creationists as a result of the evidence. And there's about, I don't know, 100 cases in both books. Yeah, okay. So it also includes cases where, um, well, I know many of the, the scientists that work for um, CMI, ICR, AIG, a number of them have gone through this same transition. They it's extremely common. I know very few that didn't go through the, the problems yeah. that I had. Yeah. So the, the other thing is, uh, uh, what kind of response have your books, particularly on the, uh, uh, 
this topics we have tonight on blunders, frauds, and forgeries, what kind of response are you getting from the secular scientists? Well, mostly they ignore it or they name call, but the reviews on Amazon are pretty much 90% favorable. But the negative reviews, and there's a couple on there, the negative reviews are typically, obviously, they didn't read the book. Yeah. So they sat there and they, I had a number that said, well, I wouldn't read this book because he's a, a creationist. And of course, we know they're not on they're liars. So therefore, why should I even bother reading this book? Some people bought the book and then they said they discovered I was a creationist and they threw the book away and they, they should warn people if you're a creationist, you can buy this book. But if you're an evolutionist, you shouldn't buy this book. Yeah. They're pretty inane, the, the negative references. Yeah. Probably do me more help than, than harm. Yeah. D does that imp impact the sale of your books on, uh, on Amazon, for example? Uh, yeah, I think it does to some degree. Uh, that's why it's helpful for me if you get on there and rate the reviews and also add reviews. And so uh, the Slaughter series, I had there maybe 40, 50 reviews on there. So that helps. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's hard to get reviews because I sell books. People read them when I go and speak, and they don't buy them on Amazon, and therefore they don't. They're not aware of Amazon carrying them. Yeah, yeah. And but you also sell your books on some uh, uh, creation ministry sites. And yeah, so quite a few of the creation ministries carry my books. Yeah, so that people can also well even prefer to get them from those sites just to help those ministries. Right. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, anything else you'd like to say on this uh, topic to summarize? Well, I'm hoping to get my next book together on the same topic. And I look into phrenology and how evolution was important in that, in reading bumps in the head. I also look into the uh, method where they did frontal lumbotomies. And that, ironically, evolution was important. And I document, indeed, why that was important. Yeah. And uh, so I have a number of horrible things that occurred in history, like the frontal lobotomies caused a huge problem. In fact, today we recognize it was just nothing more than uh, yeah. foolishness. And, uh, but I, I cover these and show, indeed, there's, there's enough cases for another book. That, so, now, you, you said you're doing a follow-on from the, your book on uh, blunders. Right. Um, Serious. And when do you expect to have that come out? I don't know. I have four or five. I had four or five books that came out last year, and so the publishers say, "Well, let's sell some books before we take another book." Yeah. So yeah. publishers are concerned about. They want to publish my books, but they say we've got to sell books and break even at least before we take another one of your books. And so, right, right. Publishers are kind of hesitant, so I need to sell books so then uh, they can publish my next books because I've got probably eight or nine books, they're all ready to go. Yeah. But uh, yeah. again, I need to, to sell the books so I can, the publishers will carry another book of mine. Right. That, another question, have you done many debates in this area on evolution? I've done three, and one I didn't do so well. I learned from it, though. Another I kind of 50-50, and the other I clearly was highly effective. And we have found it so hard to get debates because so many people know that once we present the evidence from peer reviewed journals, what can they say? And so therefore it's very hard to get evolutionists to debate us. Yeah. The common tactic is to ignore us, but yeah, I'd love to debate. And yeah. I know now how to be effective and I don't won't make the mistake I made last time. And so there, I didn't lose totally completely, but I didn't do that well. And I learned now the best way to debate, and I think if I use that best way, I would do much better. Yeah. So, w would you uh, attribute some of that to d the uh, uh, knowledge of the person you're debating? Uh, well, partially. The problem is, is the people you debate don't really understand. They're not really don't understand evolution. Yeah. I would say 90% of evolution or 98% of evolutions don't really, are really well read in evolution. You get a bachelor's degree, teach biology from most universities, not have to take a single course in evolution. So most evolutionists really don't understand the problems of evolution. Yeah. I worked with a number of scientists for years and most of them knew nothing about evolution besides it was true. That's about all they knew. Yeah. How does natural selection work? Yeah. 
that that's one that they're going to have a hard time uh, explaining. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, okay. Well, again, uh, Jerry, thank you for your time, and uh, I will have this uh, message posted and in a few days. And uh, you've covered a lot of ground, but uh, you've only covered a very small percentage of your books. There's yeah. A lot more information there. So. Uh,